I would like to open with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. <clears throat> Welcome to One on One with Staney, an event with Dean Staney Brown for alumni, donors, and friends of the Dalvalana School of Public Health. Today's discussion is about Ontario's COVID-19 vaccine rollout, including how we prepare families, communities, and systems for future adverse health events. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Sabina Vorhamiller, and I'm the co-founder of the Vorhamiller Foundation, a philanthropic endeavor with the goal of making healthcare accessible and equitable to all Canadians, and I'm a strong supporter of the Dalalana School of Public Health. Quick housekeeping, our hour-long program today will include my questions for Dean Brown, and then we'll take some thoughtful questions from the audience. Attendees may ask questions via the Zoom question and answer chat box, and a few will be selected as we most likely won't be able to answer all today. Please note this event will be recorded and posted on the Dalalana School of Public Health YouTube page with closed captions following the event. With that, I would like to introduce Dean Staney, even though he requires no introduction. His leadership throughout the pandemic has been invaluable, leading not just with his expertise, but utmost integrity and compassion, and is without a doubt I some, someone I deeply respect and admire. So here's his official introduction. Staney Brown is the Dean of the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He received his undergraduate degree in government from Harvard University, and his doctorate from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Prior to serving as the Dean of the Dalarana School of Public Health, he was Director of the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. Over the past 15 months, we have been witness again to Staney's outstanding leadership response. He has worked collaboratively with the Premier and his Cabinet on resilience and recovery measures and efforts. Staney, along with many faculty of the Dalarana School of Public Health, have played a critical role in the response and will remain deeply involved with Ontario's health strategy going forward. Thanks, Sabina. Happy to be here. I'm really uh, pleased for you uh, doing this with us today, so thank you. I am so thrilled to be here um, asking you and trying to get a glimpse of your brain today. So with that, let's make most of our hour together. I want to start off with a topic that's very near and dear to me. The COVID-19 pandemic is bringing to light racial disparities and health inequities that have long been an issue and only exacerbated by the pandemic. At last year's one-on-one -on -one with, with Staney event, one thing you said has really stood with me over the past year. You said, the impact of the disease is inequitable, but the impact of the echoes of the disease is even more inequitable. Has the vaccine rollout in Canada been equitable and effective in protecting marginalized communities? Sure, so maybe I'll just kind of start off with a slight sort of tangent on this. You know, one of my uh, postdoctoral fellows, uh, Dr. Nakia Lee Foon, made this point a little while ago uh, to me that had we really thought about the history of infectious diseases, the inequity that we see now shouldn't have been a surprise to us. And as we get ready and we think about any way that we deal with you know, the next pandemic or the next health crisis, or even how we think about any of our responses to it, whether it be vaccination or uh, mitigation or community support or anything else, we've always got to keep in mind that almost uh, inevitably these sorts of infectious diseases have an inequitable impact on society. So we've always got to be planning from that perspective. So has the vaccine rollout been equitable uh, or helped correct some of the inequities in the pandemic? Well, let's, let's first kind of figure out what we mean by equity in this, right? So we know that the disease has disproportionately, wildly disproportionately impacted communities that are racialized, uh, that are poor, that are in any way kind of uh, missing the types of resources that we need. Uh, and we know that you know a lot of this impact actually is because of the increased risk of exposure. And so uh, if you don't live in suitable housing, uh, if you have multi-generational families, if you're engaged in essential work, you're more likely to get COVID-19 just because the risk of exposure is so much higher. And so when we look at this and you look at uh, across Toronto, you can look at it across Ontario, it's very clear that the likelihood uh, of getting uh, COVID-19 really depends uh, on where you live. 
So what would an equitable response uh, to that look like, right? I think you'd say, okay, if it's hugely disproportionate in these communities, you should see a hugely disproportionate focus on vaccination in those communities. Have we seen a hugely disproportionate uh, focus? No. Uh, and initially, you know, when the vaccine strategy started off, they had a heavy, heavy focus on uh, large mass immunization clinics. Uh, those are great for people like me or people like you who've got the ability to kind of stop their day and go down during normal business hours. What was good to see is that there was a pivot shortly afterwards to focus on what they called the hotspot or the high risk community strategy, where they tried to a variety of things like uh, greater vaccine allocation. Uh, those public health units that had the hotspot neighborhoods, that's a good idea. Uh, use of things like pop-up clinics and much more kind of community tailored efforts, often led by community, uh, which I think was a really important part of it. And that was all very good. Uh, and I think helped at least make it more equitable. I wouldn't say that it was equitable, but helped make it more equitable. I think the challenge though now is that we're kind of through that first phase and so, you know, people talk about a last mile problem. I think we've got uh, a last couple three mile problem actually still there. Uh, if you look at, say, older uh, Ontarians, you know, people over 70, uh, and this is all publicly available data, the vaccination rate in those communities uh, that are hardest hit is lower among those most vulnerable uh, than it is in communities that are uh, the least likely uh, to have COVID-19. And so there's a need to really kind of redouble and, and really work at these efforts. And I think sometimes we think this uh, uh, remainder of folks who aren't vaccinated is due to vaccine hesitancy. There may be some of that, uh, but there's a lot of ways to work to reduce vaccine uh, hesitancy. Uh, part of it, though, probably is due to structural factors. Uh, you know, if you are someone who has a caregiver who lives with you, uh, it's easy to get to a clinic. It's easy. I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier to get to a clinic. It's easier uh, to get to your physician. It's easier to get to a drugstore. Uh, if you're someone who doesn't have a living caregiver and, you know, you're really sick and, you know, uh, basically shut in, it's really hard. Uh, and so pop-ups may not deal with those inequities. Uh, if you're uh, someone who is older and still working very long hours, perhaps day shifts or, you know, night shifts that make it hard for you to get around other times, the sort of usual hours for these clinics uh, aren't going to work for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you live, say, in a community that is kind of got that suburban density with lots of large tower blocks uh, and not a lot of big box drugstores nearby, it's hard to take advantage of a pharmacy based strategy. So you really kind of need to work on those last two or three miles uh, to maintain some sort of uh, equity in the vaccine rollout. Yeah, that is so important. I think you've really highlighted very well all of the accessibility and mobility issues that we've seen throughout the immunization campaign. And, you know, I think if we want to see an equitable um, and successful immunization campaign, we have to break down every single barrier. So um, very well said. I completely agree. Now, the one thing I never tire of hearing about is the history of Dalalana School of Public Health. Could you tell us about the roots of Dalalana School of Public Health, you know, what its first hundred years looked like, and how you see its role in disease prevention over the next hundred years? Okay, thanks, Mia. So I'm really proud of the school and, you know, the story of the school's founding, the story of the school's founder is, is kind of one of my favorite stories. I probably tell it too much because uh, now my kids who are you know, 13 and 14 can sort of recite it uh, almost perfectly. But, you know, the, the basic story is simply that, you know, Fitzgerald, who was a physician, uh, got caught in one of these terrible moments where uh, he had one dose of uh, diphtheria, uh, antitoxin in his bag, and he had a, a pair of parents in front of him who had two kids who had diphtheria, and he had to ask them. Uh, which kid got the dose. And it, it may seem odd nowadays, you know, why, why are we worried about what's in a doctor's bag? Uh, we might even ask ourselves, what's a doctor doing house calls uh, at that time? But, you know, this is the way it used to be. And on top of it, supply chains weren't what they uh, are now. And so it was really, um, really hard to get antitoxin uh, into Toronto because of all the cold chain and other issues. So he essentially worked with um, a patron and he worked with a donor uh, one gave their name and, and one gave a lot of money. And together, the three of them were able to construct this uh, laboratory that produced so much antitoxin uh, that Hamilton and Toronto became the first two diphtheria-free cities in the world, which is a remarkable accomplishment. 
Um, but you know, it goes beyond just that. It was the first place to make insulin, and you know, did this all at cost or all free within the context of our system. And this is before we had a system, right? Uh, that was universal. This is before we had a system uh, that was free at the point of consumption for anyone who's a resident. So it, it was really quite a landmark thing that I think you know not only helped stop a disease, it also helped set the tone for how we think about access to care and how we I think about you know access to healthcare and even access to health. Uh, but it goes on. Uh, you know, all of us have had our polio vaccine, and we kind of take it for granted now that somehow you you get a vaccine and you just put it in a factory somewhere, and you know buckets of the stuff show up. It was actually Leonie Farrell who was working at the school uh, and in Connaught Laboratories who came up with the technique to actually industrialize the production. Because it's one thing to be able to make small samples, which is what Jonas Salk was able to do with his polio vaccine. It's another thing entirely to put it within reach uh, of everyone. And, you know, we're just tantalizingly now uh, on the cusp of seeing polio as, a, as an eradicated disease. Uh, and so, you know, we've had a big role on that. Um, you go forward, you keep on seeing all of these sorts of uh, innovations, but it's not just vaccines, right? It's not just that kind of production of a, of a material like that. Uh, things like nurse practitioner clinics, things like community health centers, uh, even things like uh, on the Ontario health team. So have all had people from the school in a very instrumental, critical way, shaping what they look like or promulgating them out. Uh, you know, the early work on variations that we take for granted, that was you know, people at the school uh, doing this work when I was, well, before I was born. And you're really kind of founding a whole initiative that says, we need to think about what care works. Uh, hospital report cards, something that we kind of take for granted now. It's a result of pioneering work at the school started by people like uh, Ross Baker and, uh, and George Pink. And so the school continually has this sort of, I think, focus on discovery that really makes a difference. Uh, and if you look at, you know, the thinking now, not just what's happened, but looking forward, uh, if you look in the school's academic plan, which is, I think, our, our closest equivalent of a strategy, we talk about excellence in research, uh, we talk about excellence in our, uh, in our educational programs, but there's a whole section which isn't in a lot of other schools of public health plans, and it's about the impact and how we actually explicitly recognize and reward that. Um, so as you think about the school going forward, uh, you know, think about the Institute of Pandemics that you know, you've been uh, instrumental in helping shape and support. That's all about making sure that we've got the tools so that as we get close to the next, well, I hope it's going to be a long time. I hope I'm retired. I hope everyone on this call is retired at this point. But you know, when we get to the next pandemic, we're not starting from scratch again. Um, when we get to the next sort of health crisis, you know, it could be the types of heat domes that we see over top of, uh, of the West now where people are literally dying from heat. Uh, we won't have to start from zero. We'll have uh, faculty, students, um, the network of experts with whom we work ready to go. And not only that we'll be ready to go at the start of it, that we'll actually have the ways of thinking about uh, being resilient uh, and the ways of recovering ready to go. Because, uh, you know, as, as we said, and I'll say it again, the pandemic's been hugely inequitable. Um, the impact of the pandemic will continue to be inequitable uh, for years, if not decades. You know, and I can absolutely understand why your kids know this story so incredibly well. I can tell you my four-year-old toddler can recite how spike proteins and vaccines work <laughs> really well. Um, but absolutely, just listening to the work that the Dalhanna School of Public Health has been doing and is going to continue to do brings me um, so much joy and so much pride. So thank you for that. Um, let's talk a little about the relationship between public health trust and communication. Yeah. So I believe strongly that public policy is only as good as its communication, especially at a time when policy is trying really hard to keep up with rapidly evolving science. For instance, how does pausing the use of a vaccine affect public trust, particularly when the risks of vaccines can impact different groups differently? And what would you say to those who have second thoughts about taking the COVID-19 vaccine? Sure. So, you know, this is, this is like a really important um, question to unpack. And the way I'm going to answer the question, I think, really reflects um, my belief about people. So anytime you introduce a vaccine, anytime you change anything, there's going to be risk. Um, the job, I think, of scholars, the job of experts, and actually the job of leaders is to constantly, you know, improve what's going on, constantly address risks that emerge, 
and constantly manage uh, whatever program we're looking at. So that has its biggest impact. But it's not enough for a bunch of kind of smart people to stand up and say, well, the vaccines work. There are risks, uh, but, you know, they work. Uh, that's a great way to kind of alienate people because you're kind of saying, I'd like you to do this. But I'm not going to tell you necessarily everything. I believe the more that you communicate, I believe the more that you communicate as effectively as you can, the more you just constantly, constantly sort of reinforce transparency, uh, the better you'll do and the more that you'll engage people. Uh, I, there's a lot of people say, oh, well, um, you know, people don't understand. We don't want to worry them. We don't want to cause concern. I think that's the same dismissive, I think, um, uh, uh, can't think about the right word for it, just fundamentally inappropriate way. It's just as bad as the people who engage in misinformation, right, who are putting out a partial bit of information or intentionally wrong bit. The more that you uh, can provide information to people, the more that you keep them in the loop, the more that you treat them as partners, uh, I think the better you'll do. And this is, you know, in some ways, this is kind of an interesting, I think, revolution that's slowly sweeping through our health system. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, when we talked about healthcare, uh, we might've said, you know, the, the doctor tells you what to do and you do it, right? Uh, and there's not really a lot of room for discussion. We're now at the place where we start to say, you know, patients should be partners and we take it seriously and we know what that means. But the public has to be a partner on this as well. Uh, we can't treat them as some sort of passive uh, group that receives information and acts on it. You need to constantly engage them. Uh, now, I know that uh, that reflects a particular viewpoint, uh, but I really think the more that you engage people, the more that you talk with people, the better you do. I've spent a lot of time talking to friends of mine uh, about vaccines, about what the risks are and what the benefits are. I'm happy to say I'm about 90% uh, on convincing people who are hesitant to, uh, to actually get vaccinated. Uh, and for a few others, it's just, you know, I think there's a, a degree of fear that's been fed by misinformation that we could have cut off and stopped earlier. But I think this also kind of puts light on what is increasingly a core public health competency. And that's effective communication. Uh, you know, it, it's nice to kind of think that we're insulated uh, from the world within the university. Uh, it's kind of nice to think that if you just have the right answer, that's enough. But I think what this pandemic has shown, as have a lot of previous public health crises uh, shown, you've got to be able to communicate effectively. You've got to be willing to communicate regularly. Uh, and, you know, I, I joke a little bit about this, and we were joking before we started about this, Sabina. I hate public speaking. I have disliked it uh, since the first time I had to do it. Uh, it still makes me uh, anxious. You know, we've got, I'm looking down here at the participant list, we've got almost, you know, 400 people uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this Zoom meeting. I find that anxiety provoking. But I know, despite that, I've got to try to do my best to communicate clearly. And I don't always get it right. I have to improve it. But I believe this is something we really need to prepare our students uh, and something we really need to support our faculty on so that every time they have the opportunity to communicate, they're as comfortable as they can be doing it and they do it as well as they can. Yeah, and I think you really nailed it when you said that being dismissive does not instill confidence, right? The idea is to empower people, you know, to make these informed decisions and have that, sh you know, shared decision model making as well, you know, because that's how you build confidence from the ground up. Um, so I obviously personally could not, you know, agree with you anymore than, than I already do. So incredible. Um, so this might be a hard one to narrow down because the work done by Davalana has been absolutely invaluable during the pandemic. But what is the most significant accomplishment of the Davalana School of Public Health in making a true impact in pandemic response? Okay, that's, that's a really hard And you can have many responses to this too. I mean, it's gonna be hard to narrow sure. it down. So you know, I think fundamentally what the school's done, and it's done this from many different perspectives, is that it's tried to provide as much information as it can, as often as it can. And this can be some of our, you know, our individual scholars who have become sort of overnight, um, you know, social media phenomenon. Uh, I'm really happy to see trained epidemiologists doing this. I'm a little worried about the do-it-yourself school of epidemiology that, you know, all they require is kind of an Excel spreadsheet and a, uh, and a Twitter account. 
you know, those folks have done a huge amount and they don't always agree with each other either, right? Which I think is something the schools uh, also helped on is, is creating some debate about issues. Uh, I'm really pleased when I see, uh, you know, our students uh, actually creating data sets and platforms that allow us to get a picture of COVID and data on COVID across the country. And it's, uh, it's remarkable what, you know, in this case, our students can do. Uh, I look at what some of our students and some of our faculty did to help uh, drive and support How's My Flattening, which was you know, our first effort to really kind of get a true provincial picture on the pandemic. Um, and then you know, what you see as well is the schools become a host uh, for a lot of activity across the province that's um, designed to bring together the best uh, evidence that we have and the best judgment on that evidence that we have. And that's that's things like the science advisory table, the modeling consensus table. It's uh, the work that we've done with government on the evidence synthesis network. But it's all really been about trying to bring that information forward and doing it as well and as often as we can. What I'll say, you know, that's maybe what the schools had the biggest impact. What I'll say I'm most proud about is both what I'm most proud about, you know, in terms of the school, but also what I'm most proud about uh, in terms of my colleagues across the province. Pretty much everything we've done has been a volunteer effort, right? Uh, there's a few folks who've gotten grants and they do the work on their grants, but you know, a few folks, uh, we've taken a little bit of money to support a secretariat on different parts of this work. But for most of them, it's been public service. Uh, whether you're talking about you know, members of the table who work at Lakehead or who work at Guelph, uh, members of the table who are at uh, Padal on a school or who are at one of the hospitals uh, across, uh, across Toronto. They all do this on a volunteer basis. Um, you know, we have folks who walk out of the ICU or who walk out of the OR to get into the meetings and work away and they're still in their scrubs. Uh, you know, if I tracked kind of the time that, you know, briefs and critiques of briefs come in when we're going through this, uh, it's remarkable. It's, you know, three o'clock in the morning, it's four o'clock in the morning, they're working 24 hours a day on this. But, you know, it, it, had we started off before the pandemic and, you know, Sabina, We've been doing something like this and it said, hey, do you think you could get 150 scientists from across the province to work together on a common cause uh, without any pay? You know, I would have just said, no way. There's just no way we would have done it. But what I'm most proud about is both what our faculty and students and staff have done. But you know, what uh, my profession, I guess, or our profession across the province has done is, is really come together to try to be supportive uh, in a way that I think reflects the best of public service. I know I speak for many when I say that we're so uh, grateful for the work that, you know, the entire school as well as the science table has done. I think that uh, um, he, one of the reasons why we've done so well here, you know, relatively in Ontario and in Canada really has been because of your efforts and the efforts of your team. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to remind everyone that there is a Q&A box at the bottom um, of your screen. So please feel free to put in your questions. I just have a couple more that I'm going to ask um, uh, Dean Brown. And then after that, we're going to actually go into our audience questions. Okay, so this wasn't our first pandemic and certainly won't be our last. How is the Dallas School of Public Health preparing for the next pandemic to mitigate the implications of a disease outbreak or disease prevention? Sure. So thanks. You know, I, <laughs> there's part of me that says, well, who knows what the next pandemic or emergency is going to be. So, you know, we'll keep on trying to adjust in real time as it comes along. But I think what we're trying to do to prepare um, is really three things. The first is we're trying to build you know, both a core group of scholars and students working on issues around pandemics. And that's the Institute of Pandemics. Um, that's partly new capacity, bringing on new people, but partly it's bringing together people from all these different disciplines. There's not any question in the pandemic which doesn't require an interdisciplinary focus. Uh, you know, if you think about, okay, what's, what is a, a seemingly simple question on, uh, uh, around a pandemic? Well, vaccination, right? How do we make sure that vaccination is effective? Well, you have to have uh, immunologists who can help you figure out well in advance of anything else what the right intervals are. Uh, you've got to have epidemiologists who can help you think about uh, where you need to be vaccinating. You need to have uh, decision analysts or data scientists helping you understand where you adjust and how you sort of focus different strategies and where you may be missing opportunities. You need social scientists to figure out how do you deal with uh, misinformation? How do you deal with 
um, issues that you know may be embedded in a particular community. Uh, you need to work about all of those things to kind of sort through it. Uh, and if you don't have that uh, interdisciplinary lens, you're going to be right back where you started, uh, you know, with piecemeal, uh, partial approaches to solving this. Uh, and so, you know, through the Institute of Pandemics, we're trying to build that core group of interdisciplinary um, uh, folks that we can work with. Um, the second is, I, I think we're trying to figure out how we get a strong, long-standing data platform so we continually put out information. I'm hopeful we've got a big chunk of time now, a long period of time where no one is interested on statistics of around COVID-19 and no one's interested in statistics around influenza and no one's interested in these statistics because we're through it. Uh, but, you know, we've been working with How's My Flattening, we've been working with other partners about how we get sort of a regular reporting out. Because when we're through this, uh, it's going to be easy to forget about this and it's going to be just as easy to be caught off guard. So finding that way to constantly push out that information uh, will be critical. I think the final thing is, is just doing fundamental research on how we get ready, how we ensure we're ready, how do we understand emerging zoonotic diseases, uh, research on you know, how we respond. Uh, this, has been a, this has been basically a real world laboratory. Where we've seen a whole bunch of different approaches to response across countries and even you know, big variation within countries like Canada. We've got to learn what worked best. You know, we've all got feelings about what worked best or who did a good job and who didn't. But it's going to take a lot of zero, very deep sort of work on, on how that uh, it gets fixed. And then finally, you know, how we recover from this. Uh, you know, I think people sometimes forget that, you know, something cataclysmic and worldwide like World War II was followed by attempts to have a reconstruction plan. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But we probably need a Marshall Plan for our healthcare system. We probably need a Marshall Plan for our health system. And we probably need a Marshall Plan around, you know, the broader determinants of health that have taken a huge hit. And so actually kind of doing the work on what that looks like. And that, that really is research. It can't be, you know, a quickly dashed off report. Uh, no matter how much, uh, you know, I, I think we've done excellent work uh, with, you know, uh, one of our tables. It can't just be the product of that. It has to be a broadly engaged type exercise. Uh, and so we'll, you know, do as much as we can to support that and move that along. So I know you, um, you, you sort of touched upon health systems. So I kind of want to dig deep a little more into yeah. that. How would you like to see these health systems operate, both in terms of less complex times, hopefully we get there soon, but yeah. also simultaneously in preparation for major health events. And how do we build resiliency and equity while we're doing this work? Sure. So I think, you know, this is, this is sort of the ultimate question, right? How do you get health systems to work better, regardless of whether it's a crisis or not? And I think the, um, the answer is probably overly simple. Uh, but I think the, the magic is really in how we implement it and how we are relentless about constantly watching uh, what we're doing with our health systems. Uh, the first thing is we need more data. We need more information. Uh, and that's become clear throughout the pandemic. Uh, we're still doing sort of postal code type analyses to figure out who people are. And we're probably missing things. We're probably missing important aspects of equity. Uh, but we need more information. Uh, you've, you've seen everyone kind of struggle with talking about mental health during the pandemic. It is clear that people are suffering. It is clear where we have data, for instance, the data on eating disorders, that there are some big impacts from the pandemic and they're not good. But we actually don't have a measure of need for mental health right now in mental health care. Uh, we don't necessarily have a measure of whether or not uh, mental health is getting better. And so fundamental things that, you know, the, in the instrumentation or the measurement side of the system are missing, and they will be helpful regardless of whether or not we're in a pandemic uh, or we're not. Um, the second thing that we need is a constant focus on using that data. Uh, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of very thoughtful people talk about, say, the importance of data on equity. Uh, but then they'll, you know, these same people make an important point that, but if you're just collecting this data to classify people, don't bother, right? You actually need to use that data for improvement as you go along. And so, you know, that focus uh, that we see in really, really good health systems, like a relentless focus on improvement, I, I think is really critical. Uh, and that's what makes the data collection worthwhile. If all you're doing is collecting. It's great for me. Uh, I like to work with data. It's great for my colleagues. They like to work with data. 
uh, but it isn't great for the system. It's just a burden. Then. And so I think you know more data, but also more use of that data. Um, I think the final step is really about how we shift a few of the key emphases in the system. Uh, you know, I just finished talking to a whole bunch of uh, boards of health and, and medical officers of health this morning. And it's clear when you listen to them that they understand and they see how uh, putting public health really kind of at the center of the health system could give us a much stronger and more resilient approach to, uh, to the next pandemic. But that requires us to kind of really infuse that intelligence and ensure that type of leadership within our system. And there's, that's, that's a, that, that is a critical question for about how we structure our system and how we reward our system that we haven't, uh, we haven't addressed yet. But you know, the pandemic's also shown, I think, pretty clearly that when you engage um, people, when you engage communities as a partner, you do a lot better. Uh, and you look, it's, it's a, obviously a, an isolated example, but it's you know, one I'm proud of. I watch, say, what's happened in Iceland, where there's just constant engagement of all parts of society. And really, a, it, the result of that is a very different response to the pandemic, you know, where schools stay open, where a lot of things stay open, but you are constantly controlling what's going on in terms of the bad impacts of the pandemic. And I think that is going to be one of the challenges that we're really going to have to, you know, back to your first, uh, your uh, second question or your third question, how do we engage people? we got to treat them as partners. How do we engage communities? We need to put resources in communities so that they can design the programs. Um, how do you engage uh, universities? How do you engage uh, the private sector? All of this requires a different approach to partnership. And so I think that's, that's the critical sort of third shift. And although it, it's easy for me to say, you know, it's about data, it's about improvement using that data. You know, we talk about being a learning health system and about, you know, really that partnership. It's got to be something that animates every implementation. If we fall back on our old ways of doing business, we'll miss the... Um, opportunities that this crisis has created. Yeah, uh, and you know, I think that your point about how if we don't measure, we can't actually address is so important, but then how do we do that in a way that is actually respectful and not stigmatizing and also involves the, you know, the interdisciplinary partnership that as we've seen this pandemic has been so incredibly important to actually ensure um, you know, a proper response, a, a, an equitable response. So absolutely. So I, I took a quick peek at the Q&A box and we're getting lots of very, very um, provocative questions. And I'm very excited to get to that. Um, but before we get to that, I have my own provocative question to ask you. So I'm going to, this is my last question and I save sure. this for the end. <laughs> um, in light of Premier Doug Ford's recently stating that he's not in favor of local vaccine passports, unlike other provinces. How do you anticipate proof of vaccination for access to public spaces or for travel playing out across different provinces in Canada based on what we've seen in other countries? And also, how do we do this in a way that is equitable? Right. Yeah. So you know, I think there's, there's probably two questions here. One of which is, are we going to see a vaccine passport? And the federal government's basically said it, 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 we will, uh, because it's hard to imagine Canadians moving around without one, given what other jurisdictions have done. The question then becomes, what do we do about certification of vaccine or immunity status for access to other things, right? Would it ever be a requirement to work in a hospital uh, that you've got a vaccination? Would it ever be a requirement if you want to look in a long-term care home? Um, how far can you, uh, you know, push uh, requiring PSWs to have vaccination uh, when we know that you know, uh, creating a barrier there might actually create huge barriers to employment? Uh, so I think the first thing is, and this is the, probably the key or the most important element to surviving any type of challenge uh, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you have to have a good justification for this. And you know, this is where, uh, although you know, passports and certificates make very clear common sense to a lot of us, you know, there isn't any scientific evidence on this. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I'm sure folks saw in France after they talked about requiring uh, vaccine certification for different sectors, uh, there was a huge surge. I think it was you know, over 2 million immediately, uh, people immediately signed up to get their vaccination. So there's a, there's a logical, there's a practical argument there. There isn't scientific evidence yet. So that means you really need to be clear about what you're trying to achieve here. It's not just you know, saying they work. 
Uh, and it's probably got a time limited nature to it as well. You know, the Israelis had a, a green pass system. that was a type of a vaccine certificate. Uh, they had it in place uh, as they tried to control the pandemic and they dropped it when they got to a really low level of COVID-19 uh, cases. Now it may come back as they're seeing a resurgence. But I think you have to have a good justification and a good definition of what you're actually going to do here. I think the second thing is you need to be very clear about what you're going to be doing to mitigate or to eliminate the inequities imposed by this, right? So are you making sure that people really do have access to vaccines? You know, getting back to one of your earlier questions, are we really going the last two or three miles to make sure that our vaccine distribution is equitable? Okay, if we can say yes on that, that's a good step. Are we really going uh, hard on making sure that we're dealing with vaccine hesitancy, particularly when it's driven by misinformation? Fine. Uh, okay, if we can deal with that. And are we really going to see an impact from it? Uh, and let me flip side here. Uh, I'll bet you uh, that we have better than nine out of 10 physicians in this province vaccinated, double vaccinated already and ready to pick up on that. I'll bet you it's closer to 98 or 99 out of 100. We probably don't need a vaccine mandate there with all the attendant costs on it and a certificate. But there's other places where it may be worth actually kind of looking carefully at stuff. So, you know, I think if we're clear about what we're trying to achieve, if we put a time limit on it, if we mitigate the uh, inequity, that could be a useful uh, tool on this. Um, particularly as you know, no one, no one, I think, uh, in their right mind would want to see a return to any type of sort of shutdown or lockdown. So as much as possible that we can avoid that, and you know, certificates may be part of that, uh, that'll be a good thing. It just, it's been too punishing on too many sectors of the economy. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, your point about, I guess it really comes down to peeling all of these layers as to why yeah. people have not yet accessed vaccinations and sure, hesitancy is part of it, but so is complacency and accessibility. And I think all of that really does play, um, you know, and, and each of them require targeted focused approaches as well. So absolutely. Um, okay, so I had a chance to ask my questions and now I want to actually pass it on. Um, and so, to pass it on to our audience. And so I'm going to um, ask the first question that we received. One participant asks us, what are you most proud about Ontario's response to the pandemic? Sure. Importantly, what is your greatest disappointment about its response? <laughs> sure. And so how I would have answered that question has probably changed every month uh, as we know more and as we learn more. What am I happiest about? Well, I think I'm happiest right now uh, about the uh, vaccination progress. Uh, you know, there was an early decision early, early this year to focus vaccination into long-term care homes where the most vulnerable people were. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who are um, on one side of the whole debate about COVID-19 talk about, you know, all we need to do is protect the elderly. Most jurisdictions haven't done that when I, or, you know, have done that effectively when I watch that sort of very quick early focus uh, on making sure people who uh, lived and worked in long-term care homes uh, were vaccinated, that probably saved thousands of lives. Uh, the hotspot strategy, uh, although I think we can always do more, I think that was a great step forward and it was actually something that addressed equity. Uh, and so I'm probably most proud of that. Uh, you've seen uh, you've seen that those things actually I think have helped control what's going on. What am I least proud about? Um, it's really, it, it is incredibly challenging to balance all the different risks associated with the pandemic, right? You need to control the disease, uh, but you need to make sure that, you know, kids are continuing to develop and mature and learn. Uh, so I'm probably most disappointed that we haven't been able to get schools open and keep them open. Uh, and I think, you know, we're working on this with, you uh, uh, the Hospital for Sick Children, with the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, with the other pediatric hospitals in the province. Uh, we're going to come out hopefully with some guidance that can help make sure that if we, you know, by paying attention to ventilation, by paying attention to things like masking, by really thinking about how we constantly be aware of where we're at, we can keep schools open, we can keep kids in schools. It's, it's remarkable when you think what's been done to try to keep educating kids through the online stuff. Uh, it's remarkable when you think about how, you know, so many parents have worked hard to kind of try to make sure their kids continue to learn and continue to develop. But uh, I think 
keeping schools open is uh, something we need to do and I wish we'd been able to do. Okay, this is a great question. Um, another participant asks, what is Canada's and the school's responsibility in helping other countries' vaccination plans? Example, access to vaccines. Yeah, okay. What's Canada's responsibility? So I think that's a really, really challenging question. Uh, you know, when we made the decision to pull vaccines out of COVAX, uh, I immediately said, no, no, that's, that's wrong. You know, we need to kind of double down. We need to maintain our, our role as a, uh, as a global partner that actually, you know, make sure that there's equity in the distribution. But I was, you know, I talked to a series of friends of mine who've worked uh, in the federal government. They said, no, no, the government's first responsibility is to protect its citizens, no matter what, like it needs to do that. And so it's a bit of a challenge. I, I do think our role as a country is to try to increase the equity of access to vaccines and somehow to do that while making sure that we've got access to vaccines here as quickly and as effectively as we can. Uh, I do think there's more we can do on that. I, I do think we should be making vaccines here in Canada. I think that would have solved some of the problems for us. Uh, I do see them as something that have a strategic role. Uh, drugs and vaccines have a strategic role that goes well beyond just keeping your health system working. Uh, they go to questions of national security or, or, uh, and sovereignty. And I think that's important. And, you know, this pandemic has shown this very, very clearly that we need that. Uh, so I think we have a role both, you know, uh, immediately and in the long term to both protect our citizens, but increase access to it. What's the role of the school? Well, I think the school... Uh, has a role in evaluating and studying and educating on this. Uh, the school, as opposed to its start uh, 100 years ago, is not manufacturing vaccines anymore. It's not making this anymore. Um, it would, you know, it, as hard as it is for, say, the federal government to balance that goal of, you know, ensuring citizens have access, ensuring that we're uh, doing our job globally or our share globally, uh, the school is even more removed from that. Uh, but I think, you know, we need to as with everything, you know, be as much as pa possible calling attention to the data and the evidence here. Okay, now there have been, a, there have been multiple questions about how you have personally managed through the pandemic. And I actually really want to know the answer to this as well. So can you share how you deal with public backlash, misunderstandings about what you do? How do you take care of yourself? How do, what is, sure. you know, how do you self-care, especially in these times when, um, you know, it hasn't exactly been very, it's come as a personal cost. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of what I, you know, would sure. love to talk to you about. So look, you know, maybe just to kind of level set, no one should underestimate how hard this pandemic has been on almost everyone, right? Whether you're working in the response to the pandemic or you're managing a corner store or you're, you know, you're working in a lab uh, uh, typing uh, viruses or you're, you know, you're working in a grocery store making sure there's food on the shelves. This has been a constant squeeze of you know, your adrenaline or, you know, of cortisol all the time, because it is an incredibly stressful experience. And I think uh, almost everyone's going to have to kind of relearn uh, ways of being coming out of this. And I think you're going to see, again, these sorts of kind of echoes of the challenge of all this. So everyone, I think, has, has had to kind of find ways to work through this. And thankfully, you know, people are remarkably resilient that I think we'll do okay. Um, you know, the challenges that I say I face or some of my colleagues face. On the one hand, you've got people, uh, well, I think the most interesting thing was it was suggested I was actually a member of the Chinese Communist Party and I was in pay of Bill Gates. Um, I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> Neither are true. Uh, and I'd really love to get some Gates money to the school, but we don't have any right now. But you know, there's, there's wild things that are said, right? Uh, and I don't know why they're said. There's things that are said that are unpleasant. There's threats. Um, I'm able to kind of get through that because it's not me. You know, like I said, I've got 150 scientists uh, working on the different advisory structures. That gives you a lot of confidence in what you're saying because it's not just your view or your judgment. They really do come together and give the best possible advice. And that's, that's a remarkable foundation. And if they're willing to give up their time 
uh, on a volunteer basis. They're willing to kind of come day after day after day to work on these things. That's a lot of personal strength. Like I really take a lot of benefit from that. And there's also been a lot of nice things. Um, you know, I'm very much inspired by the example of my dad and I've had his students, I've had his colleagues, I've had his patients uh, reach out to me. Um, I had my high school science teacher uh, and my grade seven teacher reach out to me and say, you know, great. Uh, we were a little worried for a long time. It's good to see this happening. So, you know, that part's really, really re uh, reassuring. Uh, and I've got a great family. I really do. And so, um, you know, although it's stressful for me at times, uh, just like it is for everyone else, I've got a really good system around me, whether it's my colleagues uh, who've put aside whatever arguments and differences they have to support, uh, or it's my family who, you know, just done a remarkable job rallying around me. And I get, you know, a, a hug every sort of kind of 10 minutes from one of my kids, which is great. Uh, or it's, you know, uh, colleagues, friends, or, or friends of my parents who just send that. No, and that's kind of all you need. I love that. I think when you spoke about your father, especially, I had goosebumps all over. So thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question is a little tricky. Fair warning. Yeah. What is your number one concern that must be addressed? Airborne transmission, the absence of vaccinations for students under 12 and under, public school reopenings this fall. <laughs> okay, they're, they're not separate questions, right? Look, we know this is a, an airborne disease. And there's debates about, you know, is this the dominant uh, form of transmission? Or is it a, a, an important form of transmission? I, I don't think that's a useful debate anymore. We know we've got to get some type of approach to ventilation to make our schools safe. And I think there's ways to do that, uh, that can be effective. Uh, we don't know what the situation is going to be on vaccination under 12. You know, I expect those trials will report out uh, much later on this year. So we know we're not going to see under 12 vaccinated before they go back. Uh, so that means that we need to cope with what this disease really is. We need to make sure that ventilation uh, is really strong. And we need to make sure that we're careful and thoughtful about how we make sure that, you know, we prioritize schools, uh, that we prioritize learning, that we prioritize uh, those sectors that really kind of need to be open uh, so that people can both, you know, develop and, and put food on the table. So um, I, I kind of see them as kind of all related questions that we're not going to solve one by picking that. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is very true. And, you know, actually comes back to the fact that you talked about how everything is so interconnected, right? And so taking that interdisciplinary approach, even to questions like that, makes sense. Um, okay, next question. Um, many lessons from SARS were not implemented. What can public health do to get governments to listen to science and expert advice? Sure. That's a great question. Yeah. So look, I think government should never be run by scientists, no matter how attractive that idea is. They need to be run, it needs to be run by people who uh, decide to raise their hand and decide to run and who their constituents choose. And you know, it's that, uh, what's the old line by Winston Churchill or whoever it was that, you know, democracy is the worst of all systems except for every other system. Um, so what can we do to make sure that science has its fair share of voice or helps guide things as much as possible? Well, I think part of it is, is getting back to this issue of communication. You know, the more that you effectively communicate what the evidence is, the more that you effectively communicate, um, you know, both where we're certain or we believe we're certain about something and when we're not, uh, the better we'll do. And that's, I think, you know, an obligation for what we do as a school and how we train people. It's an obligation for us as scientists that we need to communicate. Um, but it's also got to be a very strong argument about against reducing ambiguity. You know, in, in my first job, uh, I was working in the private sector, and my boss always used to look at me and say, "I want a one-handed professor." And I, you know, I'd sort of look at me and go, "You always say on the one hand, and then on the other hand." You know, I, I don't want to hear the other hand. I just want to hear what we need to do. I think that'd be the wrong way to approach it. We don't want to overstate certainty. We want to constantly sort of communicate that science is a process and engage people that way. And so I think the more that we can encourage scientists and you know, the people we, we have on our team and the people we train to communicate, the better it'll be. 
Um, I think the second thing is that, you know, we need to kind of stand ready to maintain capacity. It's, it's almost an iron law of public health that as things get better and better, there's less and less attention on it. And there's always something else crying out for resourcing and supporting. Universities are probably the last place that can really maintain that type of capacity. So part of what we need to do is not follow whatever the kind of the next trend is, the next fad is, but constantly reinforce that capacity that is ready to kind of serve again when it's necessary. And so I think that's part of it. Part of it is also encouraging, you know, the people that uh, are on, uh, that are students, encouraging the people that are on uh, our faculty to do things like run for office, right? Uh, you know, I've had the, I think in one way or the other, I've worked with every minister of health since 2000. Uh, I've worked with ministers of health who had deep training uh, and had, you know, PhDs in public health and uh, other areas and ministers who haven't. The more though, and, and the more though that we engage with people who are really interested in this to the extent that they're surrounded by this type of information the better it'll be uh, and i think that's a really important thing is to encourage our people to engage you know to run politically to uh campaign for different issues uh, we'll always protect their academic integrity we'll always protect their academic freedom uh, but we need to encourage them to engage that way as well you brought up capacity. So this next question has is related to that. How do you see the health system catching up with all the procedures, surgeries, et cetera, that were put aside because of COVID? Do you now see a way on how this could have been handled differently in terms of using hospitals and surgeries? Yeah, okay. So I think there's two separate questions. Um, one of which is how do we get caught up? And one of which is could we've handled it differently? The caught up question is a really important question because it's not just you know, the fact that we've got a huge number of surgeries that didn't get performed this year. There's a series of waves that are gonna kind of hit our health system in terms of you know, missed care that are really important. There's the missed surgeries. Those are gonna be now on patients who are a little more ill. You know, thankfully dealt with most of the urgent surgeries, but you know, the other patients are continually uh, declining. Uh, there's all the missed screening. Uh, you know, things like cancer screening, uh, screening for chronic disease. Uh, there's the missed vaccinations uh, that we need to deal with. And, and I don't think we should underestimate this. One of my uh, colleagues, Alex Barron, who sits on the board of Ontario Health with me, told a story about a infant that he saw in the emergency department that was, you know, multiple months old. And he was the first uh, clinician this baby was seeing since its birth. And so all that well baby visits had been done virtually, you know, had been done with the mom trying to weigh and everything else. And so, you know, there's, there's a missed care gap as well that will start to pay our consequences. But there's more than this, right? There is all the chronic disease that we'll see from the um, unemployment and the social dislocation. And that's going to have consequences in terms of uh, chronic disease. Laura Rosella and others have shown this very clearly. And there's the bill for whatever mental health will, uh, will bring. And I expect we'll see remarkable resilience from people. A number of these problems will resolve, but it is going to have long-term consequences. So there's not just the missed surgery. There's a huge wave of necessary care. Uh, it's going to require us to rethink our system. Uh, you know, when I said we need a Marshall Plan for our health system, it's, it's going to be more resources. I don't think that's going to be the hard part. I think it's going to be rethinking how our system works so that we really really prioritize uh, prevention and promotion, that we start to tackle head on the social determinants of health, because that will start to deal with some of it. Uh, but that we also try to get um, some of the rules that prevent our system from functioning as well as could out of the way. You know, it's things that support integration. Uh, it's things that support productivity. It's a relentless focus on quality, getting back to some of the other answers. Could we have done things differently? I think in the early days of the pandemic, given that we didn't know uh, what was, uh, what this disease was like? Probably not. Could we have used things like COVID hospitals? Well, the early evidence was that they actually didn't help. Uh, a lot of them had been built and remained empty. Uh, it was really challenging to think through what a, you know, COVID free environment truly looked at. Uh, what you've seen, I think more recently with the dramatic increase in capacity that, you know, it's obviously a short-term increase in capacity in ICU. That is stuff that we need to remember for the next time that we have to respond to a crisis like this, how we really tune up capacity like that quickly and how we make sure that we're ready to tune up that capacity. Now back to the question about the lessons of SARS that we failed to learn. 
uh, you know, we got rid of our stockpile of personal protective equipment. And it's easy when things are working well to get rid of it, but that means that we're not ready when it does hit. Yep, the stockpile. Oh, it's just memories of the beginning of the pandemic when all of this happened simultaneously and all the realizations came um, hitting us. Um, okay, so we have four minutes left before we wrap up. So I have time for one last question. And I actually, I know I think this is such a great question to end off. Um, what does the next three to six months look like for us as a community? Sure. So there's a big depends in any answer. If we, and it really depends on how we, how we continue to drive more vaccination and how thoughtfully we relax the public health measures. I believe, and I, I think you know, a lot of my, uh, my team would be in the same place that if we continue to drive the vaccination as strongly as we can, and if we thoughtfully and carefully, you know, in line with looking at where our numbers are, in line with looking at the progress, uh, relax uh, uh, what's going on, we can look at an increasingly normal fall, right? The disease will be endemic, but we have the tools to deal with an endemic disease. And so you could look at a fall that's got schools open, uh, and you should look at a fall that's got schools open. You could look at a fall where things you know, open up increasingly, where we see a real return to uh, hopefully a better uh, and a new normal, uh, but at least something that feels a lot more normal, where you know, uh, going out before the holidays to do some shopping is a lot more fun again and stores are open, where uh, the idea of getting together with loved ones is not something that's fraught with uh, peril or risk. Uh, I think on the opposite uh, side, if we falter on the vaccination, uh, if we relax things wildly and without sort of thought uh, or quickly and without thought, uh, you could see a, uh, a fourth wave. And I, I don't know what the fourth wave would bring, but I think it will bring a fundamentally divisive point uh, in our society where uh, a number of people will want to see control of the pandemic. Uh, and a number of people will say, I just can't do this again. Uh, and I think that would be a bad place to be because it will, it'll probably end up eventually being the worst of both worlds rather than, you know, a choice on one side or the other. <sighs> yeah, such great last thoughts. Um, okay, so I, we received so many questions that we just unfortunately did not have the opportunity to get through today, but I think um, you know, these conversations have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you, uh, Dean Brown, for, you know, your insights, your expertise, and for talking to me and answering all of our questions today in serious gratitude to, to you, th you know, for this, as well as for all of your work throughout the entire pandemic. Great. Well, thank you. I'm thank grateful for everyone who stuck around for the hour. It's, I'm glad, glad to see so many alumni, but uh, so many other folks as well. So thank you. And thanks for doing this with me today, Sabina. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Okay, so um, we are now closing up our event. So thank you so much for attending today's event. The event will be posted to the Dalhousie School of Public Health YouTube page following the event and will have closed captions. So please do feel free to share this with anyone who was unable to join today. Stay in touch with us. Follow the Dalhousie School of Public Health and IHPME on Twitter. Facebook, as well as Instagram. Have a lovely rest of the week. Thank you again for joining us today.